Okay, so I'm going to... okay, morning, everybody. Um, welcome to IPPR. I'm Nick Pierce. I'm the um, uh, director here. And um, I'm really pleased this morning that we have Nick Bowles, MP, um, who is, as you know, the Minister for uh, Skills and Equalities across both the Department of Education and uh, the Business Department. Um, and Nick, in a former life, was also uh, head of a think tank. Um, uh, been in this kind of Garrett-like environment himself in, in the past, uh, but we're really pleased he's here to, this morning to talk to us about um, about his brief, and in particular we're interested here at the IPP at the moment in 14 to 19 education and training. We have um, Louise Evans here work leading for our project on us uh, on the question of reform of this phase. It's a very, very important phase in the education and training system. It's something that needs a lot more policy attention in our view, but we want to listen to what Nick has to say today. We've had some important announcements recently on apprenticeships. We saw at the autumn statement last week, although it didn't get much attention, an important announcement made about some um, employers' national insurance contributions being uh, relieved for those uh, taking on apprentices. There's still a lot of issues here that need uh, thinking about, particularly in the context of a, an economy that's trying to recover, that's trying to ensure it has the right sort of supply of skills. Uh, and in particular, where we've still got large numbers of young people um, who are not making a successful school to work transition despite the reduction in youth unemployment still large numbers of people who are not making a successful transition so we've been looking at other countries in particular the netherlands and australia and louise has published a report today uh, questions but we want to hear what nick has to say today and then what we're going to do i think is just do it a little more informally just open it up for some conversation and discussion we haven't got uh, a huge amount of time but we'll definitely make sure that you can ask some questions and put your issues to nick whilst he's here so nick over to you thanks for Right, yes, need to turn that up for a slightly taller Nick. Um, Nick, thank you very much indeed. Uh, very good um, to be back. It's uh, been quite a while since I was last with you, but um, since when I was setting up Policy Exchange, the first place I came was to the IPPR uh, to talk to Matthew Taylor and ask him about how you did it. Uh, I've always been uh, very much in the IPPR's debt. Um, now, when I was on uh, the top deck of the 171 bus coming here this morning, uh, when I wasn't uh, watching the rather uh, gripping clip of William and Kate meeting Beyonce and Jay-Z, um, I was wrestling with the tricky question of how do I come to you this morning uh, and not bore you to tears, but also not get into trouble with Linton Crosby. Uh, trouble with Linton Crosby is slightly um, a, an occupational hazard of my job. And, and one into which I have fallen on regular occasion. Uh, and I think that the way to deal with it is, is this, which is that I am going to describe what I think are the key elements of the reforms um, uh, to this part of the education system that we have undertaken and that indeed we're still uh, working on. Uh, but then ask you as an audience some questions that we are wrestling with ourselves and to which we don't have any final answers, uh, but which I think probably will be the key question, certainly for us, uh, if we are re-elected next May, and in which it would be very useful to have your uh, input and, and, and thoughts. Um, so firstly, what we have been doing. Um, I think that basically you can break it down into three relatively big and simple uh, ideas. Uh, the first of them, and that was very much um, the focus of some announcements by the Prime Minister yesterday, um, is the crucial importance of everybody uh, uh, gaining some kind of mastery of English written and spoken and maths. Um, and I think that that is crucial. It's, in a sense, I think in this audience, it would probably be an almost banal thing to say. I suspect there's nobody in this room who would stand up and say, oh, you're pushing much too much emphasis on English and maths. Uh, so that probably isn't the debate. Uh, the debate, I suspect, is about how do you do it? Um, and there has been some uh, debate and I think some controversy about whether the expectation that more people should uh, take G indeed take them again if they failed uh, to get a C uh, when they are in the later stages, uh, when they're at FE College or, or doing some other kind of uh, program. Uh, there has been, I think, a debate about whether that is the right route. Um, <clears throat> I have to say, we think that the figures that have come through uh, reinforce our belief that expecting people who missed uh, a, G a GCSE C grade by one, i.e. got a D, um, to, to have another crack, um, actually has proven very successful. I mean, you're getting much higher numbers of people um, now securing a C um, on, on, on that second go uh, in FE College. While it has unquestionably created quite 
um, challenging issues for FE colleges and sixth form colleges and, and, and other providers in terms of having uh, teachers who are in a, in a position to be able to teach uh, English and maths uh, at GCSE to a rather older cohort. Um, of, of young people. Um, the other question, though, I think that has come into this English and Maths, and it's one that I've taken a particular interest in, is what are we doing about those people who bluntly got worse than Ds, and who probably, I mean, if they want to have another go at GCSE, great, and, and they should be encouraged to do so, and every provider should be uh, supporting them in that ambition. But if bluntly they they don't want to, and they're probably not going to, particularly now that the GCSEs themselves are becoming uh, a bit more rigorous and more testing. What happens to them? Uh, and as you know far better than I, there are these things, functional skills qualifications, which I think, I mean, clearly some of them are, are reasonably good and some of them are respected, but I don't think that any of us would claim that they've become a currency. Um, I never had heard of them before I came into the job. I think that's a, probably a pretty good sign that something hasn't really got a broader currency. Um, and I've never met anybody who came home and said, mum, mum, I've got my functional skills qualification. And I think a, I think a qualification needs to be able to do that. It needs to have a, a, a brand resonance uh, and an authority uh, that society respects, that not just the people who are awarding the qualification respect, but that actually the broader society respects. Um, so that is why Ofquel are uh, doing a review of the uh, functional skills qualifications. And recently I asked the Education and Training Foundation to do a bigger piece of work on actually how do we, working very closely with employers as well as the awarding bodies and, and um, providers and teachers, how do we create a, a, a qualification that is not a GCSE, but that is nevertheless considered to be rigorous and which employers understand and value and parents understand and value and young people uh, will feel uh, proud to have achieved. So that in a sense for everybody, there is something that they can leave full-time education, now to be at, um, at 18, uh, that they can leave that education at, at saying, yes, I got. English and maths. Uh, I'm, you know, I've mastered them. Maybe not at the GCSE level and not in the GCSE way, but I've mastered it in a way that employers uh, respect. So that I think is perhaps the most important plank of our reforms, though probably also to some extent uh, the least controversial. Um, <clears throat> the second plank is obviously looking at the qualifications. And I think that the, the problem is easily described. It was that in a time when you funded people to take qualifications, <coughs> funding almost always produces <coughs> unintended consequences, un unintended behavior. And what happened was that you therefore, because you were funding qualifications, you created an incentive in the system to create loads and loads and loads of new qualifications, <coughs> which may have been cheap to teach, or may have been easy to get. So the combination of funding and uh, league tables uh, produced uh, this very damaging pressure uh, to create low quality qualifications, which employers didn't back helping people get jobs, um, and which, <coughs> which nevertheless um, uh, uh, providers were able to, uh, to offer reasonably cheaply. And so we went through this very big exercise of, of reviewing qualifications and of delisting huge numbers from the league tables. Um, and there will be further announcements this week about uh, the, 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 um, the, the narrower group of, of, of qualifications that will be uh, being taken forward. And I think that's been a tremendously important exercise, but it's not a one-off exercise. It's happened, but it needs to go on happening almost every year, really. There just needs to be a natural process by which you say, and it may be that there's a qualification which once did have a value, but which, you know, maybe the industry that it used to that used to value it has, has, has changed, or maybe a new qualification has come along uh, that has changed. I don't think that we should be wedded to particular qualifications uh, for their own sake. They should be subject to a very rigorous test. Uh, are they demanding in terms of the content? Uh, and then do employers value them? And if they fail either of those tests, uh, then they should not be uh, qualifications that can be uh, included in the league tables. So the, the, the whole qualification reform, and then uh, add to that um, the concept of the tech back, um, which we're not going to know for a bit. I keep on being asked in the House of Commons, uh, what is the, you know, they're on the tech back. And I have to give this rather unsatisfactory 
answer, which is basically asked me in 2017, which, which feels even more evasive than ministers normally are. Um, uh, but it, there is a truth in that, which is because like the EBAC, it's a, it's a measure, it isn't a, a qualification in its own right, it's a, it's a performance measure. We won't actually know how many people are going to get it, uh, or indeed how many people are currently striving to, to, to acquire the qualifications which will make up the tech bank uh, for a bit. Um, but in concept, I think, and we've certainly got some early Vanguard uh, colleges doing it, I think it is the right one in it provides of that core English and maths uh, uh, of uh, technical qualifications and then of, you know, A-levels if people want to mix it up a bit. Um, and I think trying to drive people towards a combination of studies that employers value is the key driver of this qualifications reform. Uh, I'm sure there's further to go, uh, and I'll come on to some of the future questions um, at the end. Then the third bit. Um, the third bit, no, no surprise to anyone, um, apprenticeships. And I would put traineeships in the same category of apprenticeships because the fundamental idea is, is a training program that is linked to and backed and to some extent owned by an employer. Um, and there is data coming out um, this week, I think probably today or maybe tomorrow, but anyway, you're going to get a, a little bit of a, an advanced billing of it, uh, which the business department have done um, uh, on, on destination data. And destination data, I think in time, will become the most powerful driver of behavior within uh, further education and indeed within higher education too. But it's not yet uh, in full form and we're currently legislating to make it possible to link up the data that HMRC have on people's incomes uh, with the data on what courses they took. But we've done an initial piece of work with data that we already have uh, in the business department. And it is very, very striking. And what is very, very striking about it is that while, you know, different levels of further education qualification uh, do provide some benefit, measured three ways, one, uh, income, two, uh, probability of being in employment and three probability of being on benefits uh, and they do provide some benefit but it's relatively low low single digit percentages one twos and threes um, apprenticeships uh, actually don't have much effect on your employment chances but that's an, that there's an obvious reason for that which is an apprenticeship is a job uh, and so it doesn't actually you're already in the job before you uh, uh, before you start um, but it has a dramatic effect on income uh, of the order of 13, 14%. And it is in a completely different category of impact than any other further education course. And I think we have to respect that, understand that, and work out how we can therefore dramatically expand without undermining the quality and the rigor and the employer link. And that is, in a sense, the key challenge that we're underway in. And you'll see headlines today, Vince Cable uh, maybe he already has unveiled, I don't know, but I think anyway, it's today, today is unveiling the two millionth apprentice. And of course, we're proud of the fact that we managed to create so many apprenticeships in the parliament. But ultimately, you know, you're a sophisticated audience, you know, this is not a numbers game. This is a question of, are these apprenticeships of a kind that are dramatically going to improve these young people's chance. Uh, and one of the tricky things is how do you get apprenticeships to be higher quality, longer, more rigorous, uh, and definitely linked to an employer, and not all of those things were true in apprenticeships before 2010. How do we get them to be all of those things and yet be creating the numbers so that we not only can continue with existing participation in apprenticeships, but actually expand it uh, as dramatically as the Prime Minister wants us to do uh, if we are elected in the next parliament. And that is probably my biggest challenge in my intray uh, and the funding reform of apprenticeships, which is, is probably a subject for another day, uh, but making sure that that is done in such a way that we actually get people who are not currently offering apprenticeships to do so that is the biggest challenge. How do you actually get not the, the same old 10% of companies who create apprenticeships to create a few more, uh, but some of the other 90% of employers who don't create apprenticeships uh, to come forward and sign up? Because if we do that, uh, then I think that we will be well on the way to improving this system. So that's, I think, our broad uh, presentation of what we're trying to do and, and what we're in the middle of. Uh, uh, my questions, I guess, that I'm puzzling over are these. Um, 
<laughs> I'll, I'll give this, tell you a little story. I, I co-chair something called the Tourism Council, which was set up by Matt Hancock and, um, and uh, Helen Grant um, uh, to, to just work with the tourism industry and help them uh, uh, address issues. And, and, and skills is obviously a big issue in that industry. And there's a gentleman on the, on the, on the Tourism Council who, I can't even remember his name, he runs Dudley Zoo. And he said, and I just found it very striking because it had been something that had been worming away in the back of my head for a while. He said, I don't understand why our local college has so many people doing animal care courses. When he said, I know how many jobs we create and it, every year, and it may be two or three. And almost all of them we do through apprenticeships not by taking somebody who's just done a full-time course at FE in animal care. And because I run a zoo, I pretty much know how many vets there are in my area and how many people they're taking on. And I also know that on the whole, they prefer people who've done a veterinary assistant apprenticeship rather than a full-time course at FE. And so he said, why are there so many people doing, you know, spending taxpayers' money on taking an animal care course when they can't possibly going to be ending up doing a job that uses the skills that they've acquired. And I thought that was a very, very good question. And it's a difficult one because we have created a system for a reason, which is, is a, a, a demand-led system. Uh, so if a qualification is on, you know, respected by employers and demanding, uh, then you can get funding for a study program that will include it. The funding is for the student, not for the course. Uh, and if the, the, the provider wants to offer it and can persuade lots of local students to do it, so long as it's, as it were, met the minimum bar of the qualification review, then in a sense there's no limit to the number of people who could end up doing it. Um, and the question I'm wrestling with is, bar on the qualification, which it should be a rigorous one, is it enough? Because if something might be a valid qualification, but for a relatively small number of people every year. It doesn't automatically mean there's an in, that it's a useless qualification to say that there's perhaps nationally, you know, room for a thousand people every year, but not 20,000 people every year. On the other hand, that begins to sound incredibly like sort of central planning and, you know, goss plan targets of thou shalt have, you know, 25,000 hairdressers and 43,000 beauticians and we're going to allocate to each area how many, you know, you can see how as a, as a sort of liberal Tory, I rebel at that idea. So that's question number one and I'd love to have your thoughts of how do you stop over, ex, over use of qualifications for which there's actually relatively few jobs out there? Um, without having that kind of incredibly interventionist um, central planning. Next question I have for you is this. Um, apprenticeships. Should we be comfortable with the idea that people uh, do apprenticeships after they've been in a job for an employer for quite a number of years? Is that now on the one hand, we want people to upskill, to continuously train, to take short courses, to, you know, to adapt and uh, and you know we want people to work broadly speaking forever so they've got to be allowed to chance to retrain at some point but on the other hand is the apprenticeships program right for that uh, again question mark we have quite a lot of people who are over 24 doing apprenticeships um, and and certainly there's no intention to to stop that at the moment but it is a question for the future I think is 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 that the right use of the apprenticeships uh, program and indeed the what are going to become ever scarcer resources um, for it. Um, and then at the other end, there's a similar question, which is at a time of full-time uh, uh, participation up to the age of 18, um, should apprenticeships be as much of a source of activity for 16 to 19 year olds as it currently is? Um, or should we be trying to encourage them either more to be doing the the sort of tech back style programs or conceivably you know a traineeship uh, or do we need something else which is sort of like a pre-apprenticeship program but isn't an apprenticeship for 16 to 18 year olds again if you if you just suddenly stood up today and said you were stopping apprenticeships for 16 to 18 year olds um it'd be a terrible mistake 
without having really, really thought through because A, the numbers doing it is high and B, there are a lot of young people who really get a great deal from it. I mean, I met a young woman yesterday who's doing an apprenticeship uh, uh, in an incredibly interesting high-tech business in Oxford and she's a brilliant scientist and she's doing a you know high uh, advanced engineering apprenticeship and she's 16 and she made that choice and her employer's happy and she's delighted and her parents are delighted who are we to say as politicians that that's an appropriate choice for a 16 year old so the question is do we do we think of them as 16 to 50 do we think of them as 16 to 24 do we think of them as chiefly 18 to 24 what's your views on that and and that relates to another issue which is levels Obviously, we'd all like to see more a level three, four, five, and on apprenticeships, and they are beginning to come through. The numbers are growing quite well, but from a low base. Um, are we content to continue to have also quite a lot of level two apprenticeships? Or again, do we feel that actually over time we should be moving towards a more uh, stretching environment? And my final question, because I've blithered on for too long, um, is, is in relation to... Um, careers advice and guidance. Um, there, you're going to be hearing more about this um, uh, in a very, very short space of time. That's I think I probably all I can say. Um, so I'm not going to try and jump the gun on, on that. But I think I can ask a question which is relevant even after you know what I know about what is about to be said. Um, and that is, what persuades... So this young woman, actually, she's fascinating, last, uh, that I met yesterday. We all asked her, we said, so who told you about apprenticeships? Um, and we all slightly put our prejudice to her, which is we said, you know, because of course teachers tend to talk about universities because that's what they did and we all are in the business of validating our own choices by trying to sell them to other people and, um, uh, uh, and why should they be any different? Um, and, you know, and also to be fair, how, how are teachers going to know about apprenticeships much? Because they're busy teaching their subjects and, uh, and it wasn't their own life experience. Um, and and so we assumed that it was somebody outside the school that had told her about it. And actually, she said, no, we had a really good careers advisor who, though he had gone to university, nevertheless took a real effort to bring in people and local companies and bring in various apprenticeships. So the question I have is what... I don't believe that just telling people, head teachers, you've got to do A, B, C, D, E, and F works. I think we tried it in many areas and we proved to destruction uh, that if, you've, if you do that too much over too many different uh, objectives, you just end up with depressing people and, uh, and in a sort of blizzard of, 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 of directives and guidance. But on the other hand, we do need to somehow prod, incentivize, whatever it is, head teachers to take this seriously and to spend a bit of money on it. And you talk to the people running the best academy chains, they spend quite a lot of money on careers advice and guidance, both on employing somebody who's probably a coordinator, but also then pulling in loads of people, uh, Nick Chambers and, and, and the Education Employers Task Force, Primary Futures, Speakers for Schools, but all of the other myriad organizations out there that do great work. So how do we get other head teachers to do this? That's my question for you. Thank you. Well, there we are. You've got um, all the questions. I don't even have to chair this, really. You've got the questions there that uh, that uh, the minister would like to hear some thoughts on. Uh, and there's plenty of other things that he said in his in his remarks we might want to pick up on. And I'm going to start at the back, which I, th I think I can see Tony Breslin. Tony. Yes, yeah. Tony Breslin. I chair the awarding body, industry qualifications. I've worked across 14 to 19. We'll just take a couple of time. Um, welcome. And uh, really, my, um, my question or my observation is around your closing comments about the young woman in Oxfordshire and the issue of careers uh, guidance. It just seems to me that we're still not tackling what is a really fundamental status divide between academic and vocational learning. And in terms of unintended consequences, some of the reforms to academic qualifications have, have inadvertently, but have served to reinforce that divide. And I just can't help feeling that as long as we tend to have a model that we throw the naughty boys a car engine, we will never get the quality of top end engineers we need. Mm. And it is to that young woman's credit mm. and to her careers advisor's credit that they kind of buck that trend. But if ever there was a case of the exception, 
Premier Rule. So one of the questions I wanted to ask on that was, to what extent does the uh, split between the Department uh, for Education and Biz help in bridging the divide between academic and vocational learning and coming and, and coming through with a coherent message for heads? Mm. Um, it, it seems to me that we need to get to a place where, where we don't just talk about vocational learning and we don't talk about apprenticeships as something we call on to when the academic has work, mm. but we talk about professional and vocational learning and we think of that as part of the entitlement that any board Thank you, thank you, Jenny. I'll take a couple more and then we'll let me reply. So, yeah. Hi, I'm um, Jenny from Impetus PEF, and we've uh, written and published a lot on school foot transition over the last couple of years. Um, thinking about your first and final questions, on the sort of useless or high quality but unneeded qualifications mm. question, there's a clear parallel with HE, and we you know, hear people lots talking about do we need this many ex graduates? It's funny that that is considered to be something that we have to accept as part of the market uh, in HE, but in FB we're, we're puzzling over it. I suppose the, thinking about your incentives question and the funding, perverse funding incentives, is there a complex formula you can come up with where FB colleges are funded to provide, yes, high quality courses, but ones that are linked in some way meaningfully to <coughs> their local labour market? And the question about local is, is, is contentious because, of course, people could and should move after FB anywhere they want to to find those jobs, but I don't suppose there's a huge demand for animal care in certain areas mm. of the country. So that, I think, always come, come back to you incentivize FB colleges to fund the, the courses that you where they are, considering that most FB colleges do run a kind of that many of them. Mm. You know, if you're in a, a medium-sized city, you've probably only got one mm. on offer. Um, and then around careers advice, how do we incentivize heads to spend but again, coming back to your destination data interest, um, I know that I'm, I'm unclear quite how we, how how Ofsted is going with its inspecting destinations data and making that a responsibility of schools to to present. But obviously, if accountability comes into comes into play for destinations on heads, then they are more motivated to spend more money on the on on the transition. And I think <coughs> talking about careers advice is quite helpful in some ways because you don't want an 18 year old to be thinking what do I want to be doing when I'm 36 because they're not going to be mm. thinking that. What you want to do is say what are you going to progress to immediately after the, the, the right. summer you spend 16? How do you keep as many options open to yourself? How do you get through the gates that lead to, to better progression chances? So I think thinking about if you say to heads, you have to spend money on progression for your mm. pupils rather than on careers, it makes mm. it much more immediate for them, I think, in some way. Question about national accountability and that um, that Whitehall split. You know, we would really love to see someone at cabinet level or just below cabinet level taking accountability for the transition, whether that is uh, probably the FE, to be honest, or it could be a biz. I think uh, the split is incredibly unhelpful, mm. and certainly there's no chance of ever getting parity of esteem. Um, well, I'm sceptical of that concept, as are IPPR, um, yeah, when, when it is yeah. so split across Whitehall. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, let's, yeah, Anne Hodgson. Anne Hodgson, Institute of Education. education. Um, I think uh, the answer to some of your questions may be at the local level. Because um, while I take what the colleague in front has said, I think. Um, most young people who are in that in FE tend to be more located in their in the locality, mm. and there's the it's, while one wouldn't want national central planning, I don't think anyone actually thinks that's worthwhile. Something that's more organised at the local level and coordinated at the local level would both um, allow you to get better matching between local labour markets and. Um, what's being offered in particularly in, in the local um, colleges and so on but also I think involving employers in that brings them into the frame mm. and both helps with very often it's not actually being told and would also help with um, uh, but I think, sorry, the last thing I want to say on the locality, I appreciate I want to take a lot of time. But I think the problem at the moment is when you're allowed to have competition that's so 
uh, acute in many areas between school sixth forms, FE colleges, sixth form colleges, you're not going to have conversations either about provision advice and guidance because everyone's wanting to bring people into their own organisation. So that local, mm -hmm. that local <coughs> More places when numbers are going down in schools, in sixth forms, I think would really help. Mm. Can okay. just, uh, yeah. just, I'm just a code to those questions because a lot of the assumptions here are that it, it basically it's the state through its accountability mechanisms, through its funding systems, through the incentives it provides that answers the Dudley Zoo question. It, it's the job of the state to make sure the FE College is doing it. And, and your question is well, how much is that on the market, how much is planning, but why Why is the director of Dudley Zoo not involved in the decision making about <laughs> what is what is actually happening in their locality? Because if you went to the Netherlands or you went to other northern European countries, the employers with the trade unions and with the state would be making those decisions. Mm. And why is mm. it that mm. he's just observing what the state does with its college mm. and not involved in it? Mm. Right. Oh, well, that was all brilliant. I mean, just, just, just fantastic stuff. Okay. The, um, I'm not vaguely going to go in order, but in truth, they were all very beautifully linked um, questions. And the, 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 the divide, the vocational academic divide, and firstly, just to put on record, and it's not, you know, I couldn't be a more junior minister and I couldn't be further from the place where these decisions will be made at the start of the next parliamentary term. But I would take, you know, all education and put it all in a department called the Department for Education. Seems pretty simple to me. Um, and I don't think that that means that you break the link with business and employers because you, you build that in throughout the system everywhere and it can, we'll come back to that subject. But I think the, the suggestion that there comes sometimes that somehow if you put further education or apprenticeships or whatever into the DFE rather than in biz, that you would somehow lose the link with business is just nonsense. Uh, and, and I think it would make life simpler. Personally, I don't observe a difficulty, you know, I'll have a meeting and I have no idea which department the officials in the meeting I have no idea and no interest in the question of which department they're in. So I actually don't see it, but what I do understand is that you all see it. Um, and so clearly there are levels at which it does become clear and it may be that, you know, the, the meetings that I have about policy uh, are with a sufficiently senior level of official that it doesn't become apparent and maybe it's in the implementation of that and the communication of that uh, that it comes through but I think it is a problem I don't actually think this will solve the fundamental problem about the <coughs> the perception of different values and I think that what we're running into is is a a fundamental limitation on the ability of government or politicians to change a, a culture and change people's minds. Um, you know, there clearly once was a time in this country when, you know, there was nothing cooler than being an engineer who went out and, you know, had a factory and all built bridges or, you know, uh, <coughs> built railway lines. Um, and I don't think it was because somehow the prime minister of the day or the monarch of the day was out there preaching the virtues of, you know, of, of, of factories and, and railway lines and bridges. Um, it was within the culture of, of, of Britain at the time and the technological change and the idea we had of ourselves as a nation. Um, and then that shifted for a whole lot of reasons. Um, again, many of them nothing to do with government. So government is quite limited in its ability to, to make that case. I mean, I make that case as passionately as I can and, and with the great advantage that I believe in it. But I do wonder if I'm sometimes not limited in my persuasive powers by the fact that I had an absolutely sort of pure form academic education. Um, uh, and I wonder whether you need to have, ideally, to have, you know, spokespeople um, who themselves have lived what we're trying to preach. Uh, and that can be true, yeah, that can be true across whole areas of government. Um, but, but in this area, I, I do wonder whether that make a difference. But I suspect that in truth, it's going to gradually happen anyway, because there actually has been a revival in engineering and high value manufacturing in this country for a whole bunch of economic and, uh, 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 and global reasons. And I sense that, you know, that there is perhaps no longer the same uh, fetishization of either media or finance, which certainly was true in the in the in the in the nineties and and in the noughties, 
Um, so I think it's probably beginning to shift the culture, uh, but I think it's a very reasonable question to ask what can government do to, to establish it further. I don't, I don't totally accept the idea that the academic reforms have made it worse. I just think we need to do the same in the technical and, and vocational area as we've done in the academic area to, to, to reassure people that we're very, very focused on, on standards and rigor and quality and, and, and value. And we've sort of done that quite heavily in the academic area, which is in a sense by implication suggested that the other area is those things don't matter and actually they matter, if anything, more um, uh, because, because the employer link is, 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 is so vital. Um, <clears throat> the uh, quality and these qualifications. I mean, I think uh, our answer, our answer is destination data. I mean, actually, what we believe and hope—I think hope perhaps is a, a, a better word at this point because uh, it's a bit early to tell—is that when that information is produced and is really, really fine-grained, you know, I did these through uh, GCSEs, and then I went on and did this BTEC and this other thing. Uh, what was I earning? You know, five years later. And I did them at these institutions. But, you know, when you start having that, <clears throat> that will be the most powerful driver of, of choice. But I think we have a given that that, that level of detail is quite far away, <laughs> and given that there are lots of other sort of complicating factors. You know, you know, you, you know, in the existing performance measures for schools, the the, the nervousness per, very properly about you know your intake, and your location. Yeah affecting so how do we measure you know, how, what's the equivalent in progress eight in destination data I, you know it's quite complicated stuff so i guess i just think we have to ask ourselves the question uh, the, uh, the, the 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 suggestion that was coming in a sense was <coughs> don't have a central government intervening to say that course you know you can have four people but not feel 40. Um, but had more of a local role. And I totally agree with you. And in, we had an interesting episode in government, which is um, when um, George Osborne uh, pulled his, his spectacular Greater Manchester mm. stuff. Um, and it was a classic George operation, you know, as in we all had a better 24 hours warning of it. Um, <clears throat> the, you know, the bid came to, to us, you know, for quite a substantial skills element of, of devolution. And I think that everybody was sort of gearing up to fight it off. And then suddenly discovered that actually the ministers involved, whether Greg Clark or Matt Hancock or me, uh, were, were, were incredibly enthusiastic about it. And in fact, we, we asked them to have a bit more than they'd asked for. And one of the main reasons was we wanted Manchester to be saying, OK, we've got these colleges in our greater Manchester area. We want this one to specialise in, you know, high value manufacturing and therefore to get all the incredibly expensive lays which we can't possibly put into and CAD cams and all of these other things we can't possibly put into every single college and then we want that college to be doing something else and we know roughly so that they can start shaping their own supply side not just in response to you know demand and competition but actually with a slightly more intelligent gear so i think that that is the answer I just, you know, my view, and I know it's the Chancellor's view, and it's very strongly the Conservative Party's view, is that there is no substitute for the accountability that a directly elected <coughs> mayor provides. <coughs> and so that is why I was very enthusiastic about that deal for Greater Manchester, mm. um, because that commitment came. Uh, but I, 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 I'm, I myself would be a little nervous about making that kind of devolution settlement across the country to existing local government structures. I think there is a question about local economic partnerships. Um, now, to some extent, LEPs have become this thing onto which we all project all of our hopes and ambitions for a perfect utopian future. Um, and not all of them, I think, are adequate to the task, shall we say. Um, but I think it is the right, is roughly the right construction uh, in the sense it's not a huge region but it's bigger than just a local authority area. It is business led. Mm. And the fact that they've been running now for a few years would, I hope, offer an opportunity to, to perhaps get them more involved in this. So perhaps in areas that aren't going to do a Greater Manchester, giving the let more of a role in, 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 in shaping what colleges um, do. Um, I loved what you said about not careers. I, I, I'm so glad you said it because it's one of those things I've always thought and never quite <laughs> dared say. I just think it's nuts, this idea that you're talking to people at 
you know, 12 or 14 or 16 or 18, about a career. You're not. You're talking about what's next. And the most important thing is what you said, which is what closes doors and what opens doors. And the key for them is not to close doors, to make course choices that keep their options broad. I hardly, I look at my friendship group. I mean, the numbers of us who are doing what we thought we were going to do, you know, even when we were 21 and graduating from first degree, the numbers of us who are still doing is, is vanishingly small. There are few lucky people who want to be a doctor and become a doctor or want to become a barrister or whatever it is. But most of us random walk. And it's been a great, great experience because it's been a bit of a random walk. And so I do very much agree with you. I think it is about your, your next two or three steps max. It's not this sort of, you know, are you going to become uh, this for you know, when you're 50 or 60? It just, it's so clear he's not going to do that. Great. Thank you for listening. I'm <coughs> going to do another round of questions, but I will, I'll just start with my own, which is just the, the implication of what you said about Manchester, which I, I also thought was an, an incredibly important deal, is that if Leeds and Wakefield or you know, Greater Birmingham and others came together into a combined authority with a mayor, yeah. then more skills and apprenticeship funding could be, you know, devolved to that level of combined authority governance if there's a mayor in place, as is, as is the case in Greater Manchester. The, but the big conurbations, that could be a model to follow, and, and the Conservative Party and the government would, would back that kind of model. That's the implication of what you yeah. said. I think is that right to say. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yep, gentlemen, here, and then I'm going to come to the back to Paul, and then, yeah. Uh, David Harbour from the Edge Foundation, just a very specific example, which I can fill out more fully on another day, but I visited Woodham Academy in Newton Aycliffe two weeks ago. Uh, the whole of year nine had been divided into teams to find out about apprenticeships in local businesses. Now, in fact, practice, they found out about a lot more than apprenticeships, because they went to, let's say, Shepherd Construction, building a factory for Hitachi. Everyone thinks that it's going to be a bunch of men with pieces of steel discovering that they have IT specialists, HR, finance, they have graduates, some of the graduates started as apprentices. And at, age, at that age, about 13, year nine, it's enough to make them think there's a lot of opportunities here I never dreamt of, mm. and that actually I'm more ambitious than I realised. Mm. Mm. Very, Very good. good. Okay, let's come, come back. Yeah, Paul. Okay, thanks, Paul. And lady here, yeah. Jill Clips and Association of Colleges. I'm just picking up um, on your first point, and also my colleague that's just spoken. We've raised the participation age, but we perhaps haven't really thought until now about the structure of the curriculum and what it is we're preparing young people for. And the young people that you cited earlier who may be engaged in small animal care, if they weren't doing that, what would they be doing? So I think we have to be careful in terms of supply and demand. I think the question is, how are those programmes preparing young people for a life where actually your, your uh, career may change several times during your life? And how are you developing those often referred to softer skills so that you are adaptable and resilient? For some young people, they're very clear about what they want to go on to and can go into an apprenticeship um, and that's appropriate for them but for other young people actually they need a broader curriculum to develop a broad base of skills mm. and move on from there. 
Mm. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, Nick Chambers from Charity Education Employers. Uh, <coughs> there was a report out last year, uh, picking up your totally Zoom, that looked at the career aspirations of 11,000 young people and map them against the predicted jobs in the UK, 13 million jobs in the next 10 years. And it did it by sector by sector, in a series of bar charts. And what bar chart showed mm. is actually there was nothing in common because what kids were aspiring to weren't where the jobs were. It's a very <coughs> graph. I think uh, a great project that hasn't really had much publicity is the LMI for All, mm. the Labour Market for All uh, project by Warwick University and the UK Commission. I don't know here. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a great thing, but actually, our teachers don't know about it. Mm. So we've got some, a bit of a hidden gem. So in all the work that's going to be announced tomorrow, if we can actually say to teachers and help them to use, we've got a great yep. product, but they don't know about it. If we can disseminate that to teachers, yes. I think that will help mm -hmm. teachers in the short term. Mm -hmm. So for people who don't know what that is, that's a uh, basically a database accessible by the website of labour market information, all sorts of occupations and jobs, their skill levels. Yes, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think they looked at it on, on 900 biggest uh, time in the world, actually, yeah. of every sort of job, and it has salaries, and you know, yeah. every bit about yeah. every job mm. is in there. It's great online, mm. but not many people are aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, did you, were you from the commission, did you want to say them already? No, I'm glad you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Right. I mean, firstly, um, I completely agree. I, I think that the, one of the key things is getting it in much earlier. You know, it's because that's when people's prejudices, bluntly, are being formed, and when they can be, you know, unformed. And Nick was just talking on the way up in, in, a, a, in a lift that, um, that he'd taken John Nash uh, to, to a primary school in, where was it, Oxford, Oxfordshire. Um, and they had a whole bunch of different people came from different businesses. And there was this, you know, attractive, well turned out young woman. And they asked all of the, uh, the kids, you know, what they thought she did. And they all thought that she was probably a hairdresser or beautician. Uh, and she worked as an engineer at Aston Martin her own convertible Aston Martin and as a way of over you know in the space of a minute transforming the attitudes of that generation of young people uh, and not yet at the sort of cynical teenage age uh, where you discount everything that every adult tells you but at that wonderful age when you're really open to being completely uh, changed by by a new piece of information I think it's it, it's absolutely critical and and uh, I think that that's sort of a, a, a big challenge for for whatever it is going to be announced tomorrow is how do you get that local employer engagement inspiration just sort of just reality you know reality isn't you know that there's a particular kind of occupation that has these particular requirements everything's a bit digital now everything's a bit customer servicey everything's a bit financial you know that's the reality of every job in every organization uh, uh, these days and 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 the only way you can find that is not through a lecture but through uh, actually seeing it and experiencing it um i'm fascinated by what you said about the university uh, I think you seem to be implying that those universities that are actually trying to be a bit more innovative and responsive and, f and you know, adaptive are actually suffering a reputation loss as a result and are finding it hard to do. Is that roughly what you're saying? I think, I think in some sense, yeah, the, the, the inception and the acceptance of the digital and some of the other kind of structures in the system that kind of work against that sort of innovation. That's very interesting. I mean, I'm not the university's minister. I, I've been... I've been surprised that since tuition fees, um, you know, went to the level they're at, that there hasn't been a greater change in the sector in terms of the, uh, I'd expected a dramatic increase in the number of part-time courses, sandwich courses, all of these different kinds of programs, um, uh, because it just seemed to be such a natural response to the reality of having to, to pay. My partner is doing a part-time degree at Birkbeck. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just fantastic. But it seems to be that everybody always talks about Birkbeck and you think, well, why isn't there, why aren't there 20, 30, 40 Birkbecks actually out there creating these sorts of programs? So I, I don't, I, I'm interested in a sense if you think that it's somehow a funding, that it's either something within the institutional control of, uh, of, of the government that is causing it. Um, but it certainly would be an interesting thing to, to talk to Greg about. I'm delighted that you mentioned LMI. I think that will be part of, 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 of tomorrow's um, uh, discussion. And don't you find that one of the frustrating things about about government? Loads of <clears throat> there's loads of great stuff out there. There's loads of information out there. There's loads of organisations doing amazing things, and yet, you know, everybody is 
is too busy just doing their day-to-day -day job, and this is no criticism of, of because we're all the same, uh, that we're all so busy just doing what we have to do that day. And I feel for head teachers when faced with this problem. I just think, you know, the amount you've got on your plate, who, how are you going to find the time to actually get somebody to find out what are all the different organizations that could help you? What is the, all of the data that you could mine and understand your local area? I think the key is that they have to have somebody to work with, and that's um, uh, hopefully a direction uh, that we can take. And just, um, Jill, from uh, your point about, uh, of course, you know, what's, in a sense, to all of the questions I asked, it's completely not an answer to just sort of close off existing things because you don't think that they're great <laughs> or until you've really thought through what are you going to put people on to um, and there is a real question I, I, I mean I would love it if almost every 16 year old would end up doing something that would ultimately qualify as a tech back that if, 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 if that world we could conjure it into existence now I think we'd all be in a great place but there are lots of young people who aren't going to do that and nevertheless, we want them to be participating full time. I guess my main point would be that if you are going to do something quite specific, I would very, very strongly prefer it was an apprenticeship than a full time program in a college. Because at least then I'd have the reassurance that even if the particular occupation that they are in a sense studying might not be one that they do for very long, might not be one that even exists uh, for very long, that just by being in a place of employment, they will be learning all of those other things that we know are uh, the things that, that people don't get, um, you know, even through the best university education, they just don't get uh, that understanding of, of life and, and reality and dealing with people and, and the like. So that's why I think to the extent we can, we want to move people into apprenticeships uh, so that then, in a sense, it doesn't matter so much what is the particular, it's the general employment behavior that they learn, which will, will last throughout their lives, whatever they do. Thank you very much, indeed. It's been really interesting for me. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you very much, indeed. In fact, I thought it was a really engaging session. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for your questions. Thanks to Nick for spending the time this morning in the busy schedule. And do look out for our work on 14 to 19, which will be coming out in the spring next year. Thanks very much, indeed. Excellent. Great. Thanks, Nick.